Hi, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at Kings Harbor. And thank you so much for utilizing this resource. Our hope for you and anything that we provide is that you would expect transformation, that we could demonstrate love towards you because of the love of God demonstrated to us, that you would have the faith stirred in you to deal with obstacles and to see opportunities, and that ultimately that the kingdom of God would be revealed in every area of your life. And so our hope with this resource is that the Lord would speak to you powerfully. Um, Second thing, let me say this. So if you are a guest here with us or you're watching online and you're new with us, uh, maybe that's not something normative that you've seen. Somebody from another part of the world talking about how the Lord's working in the world. But I, I think that the Lord is trying to grab our hearts in a way to say, hey, this is bigger than what's right in front of us. And so even as we jump into our text in, in the book of Exodus, we're going through the third cycle of the plagues. We're going to begin to see this intensification of what the Lord's doing. And even in the Lord's language, he say, hey, something's bigger going on than what you realize. So if you've got a Bible, go to Exodus chapter 9. That's where we're going to be. Uh, I just want to jump in with the main idea. Uh, and so here's what I want you to see as we walk through uh, the, this uh, portion of text. The plagues continue to reveal God's power. All of creation is submitted to his will. And so what we'll do, we'll just continue to walk through plague seven, plague eight, and plague nine, and we'll begin to see that being put on display for us. And so Exodus chapter nine, starting in verse 13, would say this. Then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh. Tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may worship me. For this time, I am about to send all my plagues against you, your officials and your people. Then you will know that there's no one like me on the whole earth. By now, I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague, and you would have been obliterated from the earth. However, I've let you live for this purpose, to show you my power and to make my name known on the whole earth. You're still acting arrogantly against my people by not letting them go. Tomorrow at this time, I will rain down the worst hail that has ever occurred in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Therefore, give orders to bring your livestock and all that you have in the field into shelters. Every person and animal that is in the field and not brought inside will die when the hail falls on them. Those among Pharaoh's officials who feared the word of the Lord made their servants and livestock flee to shelters. But those who didn't take heart the Lord's word, left their servants and livestock in the field. Now, as we jump in, I, I want to I pause. We, we've, th this is our third week of looking at plagues. Um, it feels like in some ways we've got some mastery over this. But the language of the Lord as he's telling Moses to go have a conversation with Pharaoh has shifted. It feels like it's getting a little bit more intense. If I could depict the image for you, it feels like the Lord is sitting in the room, taking off his rings, taking off his watch, rolling back his sleeves. It's like, now we're about to go to work. And so he makes this statement that, hey, Pharaoh, here's what's about to happen. That thus far, I've actually been pretty gentle with you, which I think if you had gone through the river turning the blood, having gnats and flies, having frogs, having your livestock die, having boils all over your body, his definition of gentle and my definition of gentle are extremely different. But he's making this statement that like, if I st stretch out my hand to strike you, like you guys would be gone. And so it feels like something's shifting here. Even what he says is that now I'm going to send all my plagues on you and your officials and your people. It seems like the Lord's starting to ratchet up the intensity of what he's doing. And what we're going to see in the next three plagues, there's something that has a larger scope of what's happening. Both the scope of the ruin that it causes, but also the scope of what the Lord intends to accomplish. In fact, he'll make this statement. He said, I'm doing this. In fact, I haven't done all that I could do because this could be like a Mike Tyson fight. The bell rings, I swing, you're done. Like it could be over that quickly. But instead, I've taken my time because I want to show you my power and I want my name to be known. Yeah. All things that we know, except for there's a different qualifier here. Not just known to you, Pharaoh, not just known to the Israelites of this generation, but known throughout all of the earth. And the Lord keeps his word because you could flip forward a few books of the Bible, get to the book of Joshua. And when Joshua and Caleb as spies show up with Rahab and they say, hey, we're coming in. She's like, hey, whatever you do, we heard about what your God did to Egypt. Don't do that to us. 
And so there's this, the making of the Lord's name being known, not just for one individual or just one nation or just one group of people. In fact, we'll read in just a few verses, the Lord would say this again, that I want my name not just to be known throughout the earth, but I want my name to be known for generations. Like the Lord is doing something bigger than just this guy named Pharaoh, who, well, his name's not Pharaoh, his title is Pharaoh, who happens to be sitting in this moment as opposition to God. And as we read these first few verses, it's easy to see that the Lord's making a statement that even Pharaoh's continued opposition serves God's purposes. The Lord will be known throughout all the earth. And so the Lord's making a statement, hey, Pharaoh, I'm going to get my glory. I'm going to get my renown. People are going to know who I am. And either it's going to be through your submission or through your destruction, but they're going to know me. May I just say to you in the room that God is going to be known. He's either going to be known through your submission or he's going to be known by, because you become a cautionary tale of the foolishness of trying to oppose God. Yeah. And Pharaoh, with this plainly being stated, like, I, like I'm going to put this on the table. I can't fight. So if you get mad at me mid-sermon and you come in here and try to take me out, like I'm, I'm not taking a punch from you. Like I'm just, I'm just running. So there's a reality that when God starts making this statement, now we're not playing games anymore. This would be the time that you say, all right, you know what? I'm gonna let his people go, but we'll see what happens. Verse 22, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven and let there be hail throughout the land of Egypt and on people and animals and every plant of the fields and the land. So Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail Lightning struck the land, and the Lord rained hail on, on the land of Egypt. The hail, with lightning flashing through it, was so severe that nothing like it had occurred in the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. Throughout the land of Egypt, the hail struck down everything in the field, both people and animals. The hail beat down every plant of the field and shattered every tree in the field. The only place it didn't hail was in the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron. I have sinned this time, he said. The Lord is the righteous one, and I and my people are the guilty ones. Make an appeal to the Lord. There's been enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go. You don't need to stay any longer. Moses said to him, when I have left the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease. There will be no more hail, hail so that you may know the earth belongs to the Lord. But as for you and your officials, I know that you still do not fear the Lord God. The flax and the barley were destroyed because the barley was ripe and the flax was budding, but the wheat and the spell were not destroyed since they were later crops. Moses left Pharaoh in the city and, the, and spread out his hands to the Lord. Then the thunder and hail ceased and rain no longer poured down on the land. When Pharaoh saw that the rain, hail, and thunder had ceased, he sinned again and hardened his heart, he and his officials. So Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he did not let the Israelites go as the Lord had said through Moses. So as the hail begin, Moses begins to stretch out his hands and the hail begins to come down and begins to cause destruction. And the writers wanting to make sure that you see the magnitude of destruction, that it's hitting every animal, every person, every tree, everything in the field, that things are being destroyed uh, indiscriminately by this hail. But I also just want you to think not just about, man, this is a bad storm, because if you've lived in the South and you've caught hail, you can say, you know what, hail destroys some stuff but there feels like there's something bigger going on. It feels like creation is all of a sudden out of control. That on God's command, that, that for a long time, creation seems to be working in our favor, but then there's these moments when the Lord by his command will allow creation to show that even I have mastery over this and this is a judgment towards you. You don't have to look any farther than reading the book of Genesis and you get to the story of Noah's ark and it had never rained. And then all of a sudden, God who said back in Genesis 1, let the waters above and the waters below be separated that I might make land that people could flourish. And all of a sudden he said, I'm not holding it back anymore. And all of a sudden it begins to flood. And this feels like it's a nod to it. It's, a, it's icy balls of water coming out of the sky, crushing and destroying things. 
And here's the odd thing to me, because we just read a few verses earlier that those that feared the word of the Lord, they brought their livestock in, they brought their animals in. But how did they find this out if Moses went to Pharaoh? How is it that Pharaoh himself is fine? Like we don't get a picture of Pharaoh standing on the outside with it, taking his headdress off saying, bring the hell, Lord, I'll take it on, I'm the storm. Like he didn't say anything like that. So apparently he believes the Lord enough to keep himself inside and to warn a few people, but he doesn't believe the Lord enough to turn his heart around. And then when the destruction comes, he makes this statement, I have sinned. You're the righteous one. We are the guilty ones. Moses, go to your God. Tell him to turn this back. I'll finally let you go. You don't need to stay any longer. And I just want to warn us that there's a difference between recognition and repentance. That sometimes we play this game of recognizing the the chaos that our sin causes. We recognize that it's destroying things and messing things up and we don't like the pain that inflicts and that will turn you around for a moment really quick. Some of us have prayed this prayer, Lord, if you get me out of this, I promise I will never do that again. And as quickly as he is able to say, would you remove this from me? Moses is just as quickly able to respond back, hey, the Lord's gonna, gonna pull this back. But I just want you to know, you still don't fear him yet. Yeah. And what's interesting to me is that at no point does Pharaoh say, no, I'm offended by that. I recognize my sin. He's like, oh yeah, whatever. Just make sure it goes away. Yeah. Then we get this weird agricultural aside about the flax and the barley. But I want you to see that even in, the, even in that, there's this picture of that which is sheltered is protected and that which comes out or that which was available and standing in the midst of the hail was destroyed, that those that took cover were okay and that things and those that didn't were faced destruction. It's as if the Lord was saying, this principle goes even down into the vegetation that if you would take cover and heed to my word, there's protection for you. But if you stand on your own strength, that you'll be destroyed. And then just as the Lord said, through Moses, Moses goes out of the city, prays to the Lord, the hail, the thunder, the lightning stop. And Pharaoh's like, about that. In fact, the text says it in a really specific way. It says that he sinned again and made his heart heavy. And we've talked about this week after week. There are two terms for that. One of the terms, kabed, is this idea of making yourself heavy with guilt. And this is language. This is God has shown in the intensity of his power what he can do. He's seen it, said, yes, I recognize that I've sinned, and then made his heart guilty again by just going back to the old pattern. And it says the state of his heart was hard because as the Lord said, he was not being changed. And then we see the next plague. Verse one of chapter 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have, heard, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials so that I may do these miraculous signs of mine among them. And so that you may tell your son and grandson how severely I dealt with the Egyptians, see the language of, of multiple generations knowing what's happening, and perform miraculous signs among them, and you will know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went in to Pharaoh and told him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may worship me. But if you refuse to let my people go, then tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They will cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. They will eat the remainder left to you that escaped the hail. They will eat every tree you have growing in the fields. They will fill your houses and all your officials' houses and the houses of the Egyptians, something your fathers and grandfathers never saw since the time they occupied the land until today. Then he turned and left Pharaoh's presence. Pharaoh's officials asked him, how long must this man be a snare to us? Let the men go so that they may worship the Lord their God. Don't you realize yet that Egypt is devastated? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. Go worship the Lord your God, Pharaoh said, but exactly who will be going? Moses replied, we will go with our young and with our old. We will go with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds, because we must hold the Lord's festival. 
He said to them, the Lord would have you to be, would have to be with you if you would ever, if I would ever let you and your families go. Look out, you're heading for trouble. No, go, just able-bodied men, worship the Lord since that's what you want. And they were driven from Pharaoh's presence. And I want you to see two things really quickly in just this uh, section of text. So Moses, again, and we see this pattern, the, the, the first and second uh, plagues in a series start with a warning. Uh, we saw a warning before the hail. We're seeing a warning before the locust. He goes in and even before the locusts come, there's this opportunity for Pharaoh to say something, to change something, to negotiate. And so they walk in and they say that this is what is about to happen. The, the severity is just going to continue. The, the magnitude of locusts that are going to invade, you are not going to be able to see the ground. And what little you have left is going to be destroyed. And, and they start with this phrase from the Lord. And it's interesting because I'm not sure that there's anywhere else in scripture that the Lord would speak these words, that the Lord would say, how long are we going to do this? That, that how long language is language that, that we usually attribute to exasperation. We talked about a few weeks ago, Psalm 13. If you've been struggling with discouragement, then one of the things you can pray is Psalm 13. How long, O oh Lord? Like usually we, with a short sense of time and not understanding the full magnitude of what's going on, it's easy for us to get frustrated with the, the pace of things. But it's interesting that the Lord would say through Moses to Pharaoh, or to Pharaoh how long are we going to play this game, homie? That's, that's not what your Bible says. <laughs> and then, just a few verses later, his officials walk in and they echo these words. How long, Pharaoh, are we going to do this? We are being destroyed. I don't know what delusions of grandeur you have. Like just a few verses earlier, they were with Pharaoh and it said that their hearts were hardened also, but something happened in them looking what's going on. And now they're saying with the same level of exasperation, how long are we gonna do this? This is not working in our favor. You are not Yahweh's equal. Stop doing this. And Pharaoh says, yeah, y'all can go. Who are you taking with you? Now, there is something that's truthful about the question that he's asking, because in that day and age, most of the time it was given to men who were able-bodied to go and worship whatever deity that they worshiped. And so he's, he's exposing something. He's asking a question that makes sense in his mind. But it feels like he has missed the entirety of what these other plagues have been saying. The Lord doesn't just want a portion of his people. The Lord wants all of his people to worship him. The Lord wants all the praise that he's worthy of. He wants all the adoration that he's worthy of. He doesn't want just a little bit or just a section. This is not representative worship, but he wants all of his people to be able to go before him. And Pharaoh's like, that's not gonna fly. You guys are up to no good. The Lord must be with you. Why would those words come out of your mouth after seven plagues of the Lord proven? No, he with them. And yet he would say that unless he's here with you, I'm not doing that. And it feels like, all right, apparently we're going to keep doing this. And verse 12 would say this. Then the, Lord's, the Lord then said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt and the locusts will come up over it and eat every plant in the land, everything that the hail left. And so that, that agriculture mention of what happened with the flax and the barley also says, hey, there was something left and that's going to be destroyed now too. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt and the Lord sent an east wind over the land all the day and through the night. By morning, the east wind had brought in the locusts. The locusts went up over the entire land of Egypt and settled on the whole territory of Egypt. Never before had there been such a large number of locusts and there will, and there will never be again. They covered the surface of the whole land so that the land was black and they consumed all the plants on the ground and all the fruit on the trees that the hail had left. Nothing green was left on the trees or the plants in the field throughout the land of Egypt. Pharaoh urgently sent for Moses and Aaron and said, I've sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Please forgive my sin once more and make an appeal to the Lord your God so that he will just take the death away from, from me. 
Moses left Pharaoh's presence and appealed to the Lord. Then the Lord changed the wind to a strong west wind, and it carried off the locusts and blew them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the territory of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the Israelites go. And I mentioned before that what we're seeing with the hail feels like this a massive picture of creation turning in on itself and, and being out of control. And it feels like the locusts are just continuing that. That yes, the locusts were in their houses. Yes, the locusts were on the ground and locusts were on them. But the description of what the locusts were doing seems to be very intentional. That all of a sudden, that there was no, there was no tree left spare. There was no fruit that was still available. That there was nothing green. That all of a sudden, it felt like it was this wild wasteland that had lost any chance of causing flourishing for the Egyptians. It almost feels like the Lord's rewinding the clock and saying, "Hey, let's go back to the beginning. Before I set things in order, this is what it would have been like." And the locusts are making that happen so much so that Pharaoh's language is, "Would he remove this death from me?" The level of ruin and destruction that's going on, it feels like it's beyond control. This feels like it's like this is, can't be bared anymore. I have sinned. Would you forgive my sin? Would you remove this from me? Then I don't want to miss the, the exactness of the language that the wind changed from east to west. And as it blew the locusts, that all the locusts went into the sea and were drowned by the Red Sea. And the language would say, there was not one of them left. It's as if this, this mighty army that was intent on causing and causing destruction was being removed by the Lord into a place of destruction. He was leaving no sign of them left. It's, this, it's as if it was a preview of coming attractions. And if you flipped forward to when the Egyptian army and the Egyptians decide to go after the Israelites and chase them into the Red Sea, it says that they're covered by the Red Sea and there's not one of them left. This is a measure of God's control over all things and he continues to display that. And then the language would say, and the Lord allowed his heart to be strong, to be rebellious, to be set in its ways, to expose who Pharaoh is and to show the Lord's power. But over and over again, we've just seen these echoes of judgment. His officials who were with him have turned against him that this picture of creation falling in on itself, that even though he doesn't know it, this picture of here's the judgment that's coming for you, just like these locusts, you're gonna be devoured by the sea. There are these echoes of judgment and yet it just doesn't feel like Pharaoh is paying attention. I wrote it this way. Neither Pharaoh's officials nor the locusts themselves speak loudly enough to break Pharaoh's opposition to the Lord. If the people who are doing sin with you are like, hey man, we're out, this, this has gone too far, that's probably a good indicator you shouldn't keep going. Everybody's got that group of friends that are down for whatever, and when those friends stop being down for whatever, like, man, we can't go with you, that might be a good time to change your mind. The fact that, you, that there's nothing left that there's nothing on the trees, nothing in the grass, there's no green left for you, that you've built your life on the flourishing of the Nile and how it's made the basin that you live in green and flourishing compared to the rest of the world, and all of that's been gone in an instant. How to change and say that the Lord's doing something that I ought to recognize. And yet Pharaoh just keeps pressing into the foolishness, and he will not change his ways because the Lord is exposing, setting his heart like stone to be what it truly is. And then the ninth plague. Then the Lord said to Moses, notice that there's no warning for Pharaoh here. Stretch out your hand toward heaven and there'll be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was thick darkness throughout the land of Egypt for three days. One person could not see another, and for three days they did not move from where they were. Yet all the Israelites had light where they lived. Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, go worship the Lord. Even your families may go with you. Only your flocks and herds must stay. Can we just have a conversation? <laughs> Let it go, bro. <laughs> like, the continuance to say, I'm gonna let you go, but I'm gonna keep this. Like, sometimes you just need to know that you lost. Apparently he has not reached that point yet. Moses responded, 
you must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings to prepare for the Lord our God. Even our livestock must go with us. Not a hoof will be left behind because we will take some of them to worship the Lord our God. We will not know what we will use to worship the Lord until we get there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he was unwilling to let them go. Pharaoh Pharaoh said to them, leave me. Make sure you never see my face again. For on the day you see my face, you will die. As you have said, Moses replied, I will never see your face again. And I just, if all along the way we're seeing this picture of it feels like the Lord's rolling back the clock on creation, what is a more deep indictment of that than the God who said, let there be light saying, let there be dark. Now, I I understand, right? Like we live in the city and we have a bunch of smog. And so therefore when it's dark at night, like we can't see the stars. And so like we think we know darkness, except for you've got a cell phone where you can turn on your light. But this is the type of darkness that it feels like nobody's lighting a torch to make it better. This is the type of darkness that makes you question if you've gone blind because you can't see. Can you imagine that day that you wake up? And I I understand that there are parts of the world like Alaska where during the winter that it's dark for so much of the day that it causes seasonal affect disorder where people are depressed because they they haven't seen and experienced the sun. But this is deeper than that. Because at least there, there is the moon to rule over the night, as Genesis would say. But there's, there's no light whatsoever that people can't see people around them. People are asking the question, do my eyes work? Like, the, the people can't see one another. Like, this isn't one of the situations where, oh, man, it's dark. Nobody's paying attention. I'm going to steal myself a TV from Sam's Club. Like, this is, like, nobody's doing anything but staying where they are. Because it is so dark that the Lord describes it as a darkness that can be felt. It feels like the darkness is not just a a manifestation of the lack of light for the eyes, but lack of light for the world. It feels like something of God's presence has been removed and that's when the darkness has moved in. And even after three days of that, Pharaoh's not willing to let it go. He's not willing to fully let them go. It's as if he needs to clutch on to some level of mastery to say, but but at least I still have this. And the Lord has hardened his heart. He set him in his way that it would continue to expose the power and the magnitude of what God's doing. At this point, it feels like the common grace of God has been removed from them and they are now seeing what it feels like if he were not uh, presiding over all the way that creation works. A few years back, Sky and I had gone to dinner at the house of some elders at the church that we worked at in Dallas. And um, Jeff and Marianne Haley, incredible people, Marianne, an incredible cook. And so like anytime Marianne said, hey, do you guys want to come over for, I was already there before she finished the sentence because she's just incredible. And so it was a Sunday night. We go over, we're going to have dinner. We finish eating dinner and like you're at the house of an elder. So you're expecting this to be like this deeply spiritual moment. And they're like, hey, season premiere of Walking Dead's on. Do you guys want to watch it with us? And I was like, I'm not really sure this was going to go this way, but all right. And so we sit down and we begin to talk about watching it. And we, we enjoyed the show. They enjoyed the show. I'm sure we had talked about it at some point. So that's why they invited us over to watch it. And Jeff looked over at us and he said, you know, why I like watching The Walking Dead. I'm like, I don't know what could possibly come next after the start of that sentence. He was like, I like it because it reminds me that this is what the world would be like if the Lord removed his common grace. That if he was not making sure that the things that are supposed to normally function like they do, that this is what the world might look like and it would expose who we really are. And it's interesting to me that it feels like the Lord's moving the common grace of superintending over creation and yet it exposes who Pharaoh really is and it's who we thought he was this foolish man who thinks that he is equal to the task of standing in opposition to God. And even when his people can't see their hands in front of their faces, even when his officials are begging him, stop doing this. Even when the world around him has gone back to being void and formless, this wild wasteland, he still has the audacity to think that he can make deals with God. 
the plague of darkness has real and symbolic implications. God's grace is no longer holding back the darkness that exists in Egypt. It's almost as if the Lord's saying, this is what you've been in all along. I'm just now letting you see it. So what do we do with that? The plagues continue to reveal God's power. All of creation is submitted to his will. Tom spent time last week talking through the beauty of the distinction, the redemption that the people of God were having. And that's why Goshen seemed to be protected because it was part of God's redemption and rescue for his people. And I just, I, I, I agree with that. I think that's true. I love it. It's beautiful. And I haven't talked much about how over and over again, Goshen doesn't seem to be affected by these plagues. But it's almost as that if, if Egypt is experiencing decreation, it feels like Goshen is this spot of creation or new creation that exists in contrast to the brokenness that's around them. So when I think about us and I think about our call in the world that we live in, I think we're perfectly placed to be like Goshen in the midst of Egypt. Let me, let me explain. I wrote it this way. We've been perfectly placed by God to be a contrast and a revelation to those who have not known his grace. Like where you are is not by accident. This week I was having a coffee with a young pastor in the area. He, he reached out to me and said, hey, can we grab coffee? Uh, can we talk about ministry? And I said, great. Um, we, we went over to a place I don't normally go. I don't spend a lot of time there. Um, and we were there having our conversation. We decided to sit outside instead of inside because it was, it was warm enough and nice enough that day that it made sense. Uh, we're talking about different things. We got to talking about preaching. In the middle of talking about preaching, I asked him a question about music because the, the analogy I was gonna make is just like you feel music, I, my hope is that people feel preaching in the same way. There's a lady sitting a few tables over and I asked him the question, hey, what kind of music do you listen to? And she was like, yeah, what kind of music do you guys listen to? I was like, I... I didn't, didn't know we were all talking about preaching here. And so she was like, do you listen to gospel? Like black gospel? I was like, come on, lady. And so she's like, my dad was a DJ. And so growing up, he like, we had all types of stuff in the house. We listened to Temptation. She's like, listen, this catalog of stuff that she listened to. And I was like, I didn't know that we were doing this, but I guess we're doing this. And so as the conversation went, she began to tell us about how she used to go to church, but she hasn't been going to church and how she feels estranged from the people of God and how she's been dealing with the series of illnesses that hasn't allowed her to be with the people of God. And so at this point, I'm like, okay, we're doing this. And so I finally just said, hey, thank you for sharing all that. What's your name? We exchanged names. And then I said, hey, can me and my friend come over and pray for you? And so now in the middle of this restaurant, like we're outside of this restaurant, we're standing there praying for this woman, laying hands on her, praying that the Lord would heal. Like this is this moment. And then a dear sister from our church comes out and was like, hey, that's my pastor. You should come to my church. Like this becomes this moment, right, going on. And I just want you to recognize that we're perfectly placed for that. If we had chosen to go where I would normally go for coffee, we wouldn't have encountered that lady. If we had gone on Wednesday instead of Tuesday, we wouldn't have count, encountered that lady. If I had said, well, I mean, I got a hard stop at nine o'clock because I got to be at staff meeting, we would never have that conversation with that lady. If we had decided to sit inside instead of outside. And so it's like all of these things working together in the plan of the Lord and having a conversation and we'd been talking for an hour and I, I said the word music and she heard it and it drew her in as if we were this contrast because she'd been listening to the conversation. These two guys, I was gonna say these two young men, one of us young, one of us slightly less young. We're showing something about the character of God. And at the end, we're praying for this woman publicly, boldly asking the Lord to heal her of the series of illnesses that you and I have been perfectly placed to be that type of revelation of who God is, but also a contrast to the darkness of the world. You and I get to be Goshen. This is why when I talk with you about our vision, about this call with the, with the Lord's help, with our efforts fully dependent on the Lord to be this army of gospel-centered leaders multiplied to bring kingdom flourishing into grace deserts. The reason that I'm confident about that is that you have been perfectly placed to be that. 
So if you are an educator in the public school system, we are not looking down our nose at you saying, we wish you were more holy and went somewhere else. You have been perfectly placed to be the voice and the character of God like Goshen in the midst of the darkness of the school classroom. That you live in the neighborhood that you live in, not because that's what you could afford and that's the only place that you can get in, but you're neighbors to those people because you have the opportunity to be the type of gospel-centered leader that brings light in the midst of darkness that they can feel. That you get to be that parent that gets to be part of your kid's team and your kid may be awful at that sport and you may only be there to pass out oranges and to say good job when they're not doing a good job, but you're also there to be the type of gospel-centered leader that brings light into darkness, that brings flourishing into wastelands, that you and I have been perfectly placed for this. And sometimes... You don't even know what's gonna be the thing that opens the door. Sometimes it's not the beauty of your strength. Sometimes it's the the authenticity of your fumbling that the Lord will use to have somebody say, but you look different than the rest of the world. Instead of playing the recognition game, you actually repented of the way that you did this wrong. I just wanna invite you and encourage you that the Lord is calling you to be a piece of new creation in the midst of what feels like decreation, to be light in the midst of darkness, to be flourishing in the midst of a wasteland, that the Lord is accomplishing his purposes and showing his power, and you and I might be the most resounding testimony to that. And we're just called to play our part. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you. Thank you for these men and women whom you've perfectly placed. Acts would say that you would uh, set the boundaries of our dwelling and allot the periods in which we live so that those that are groping around in the darkness trying to find you might actually be able to. Would you use us in that way? And for some of us, that call is immensely local. And for others, there are points on the map, places like the B family going to South Asia saying, Lord, we see the trauma and the darkness that's there. We want to raise up people to be the light. There are others that are called to live and be that way. There are others that are called to be the faithful voice in the room of engineers as they're thinking through how to build the next technology to improve cars or rockets or something in between. Like there's that clear call. And so Lord, would you, would you help us to see that while you are at work exposing the brokenness of creation, that you've given us the opportunity to be Goshen. Not because we're in this building. This building's not Goshen. But where your presence is, where your power is, that's Goshen. And so even when we leave this place, you are empowering us to be the type of light amongst darkness that we get to see in this text. Would you help us to be enduring and faithful and patient and long-suffering that you might make your name known throughout the earth for generation upon generation until you return again? It's in your matchless name I pray, amen. Thanks so much for checking out this message from Kings Harbor. We would love to connect with you. If you go to kingsharbor.org slash hello and fill out a short connect card, that allows us the opportunity to follow up with you. Also, if this message has been a blessing to your life, we believe that the Lord wants to rule and reign in every part of who we are. That means our time, our talent, our treasure. So if this has been a blessing, we would ask that you would consider contributing back to the ministries of Kings Harbor so we can continue to bless and help people in the same way that we hope we have done for you. With that in mind, we want you to know that our heart towards you and our heart towards the world around us is that we want to be a love forward people. And we're praying that you would join us in that.